everybody and welcome back to another video. Now, uh, in the last video we very excitingly managed to derive these two equations from the two second order equations for which describe the motion of two masses um, coming together under their own mutual gravitational attraction uh, with no external forces. So uh, we're now ready to actually solve these equations and find x1 and x2 explicitly and also get some other nice things out of it. So uh, let's start off. Let's start off with the nice things. Okay, so nice things. Now, one one useful thing you might want to find from this is the time that it takes to for the masses to come together. Um, so the first thing is going to be the t. Just, just I'm going to call this big T, which is the time taken to come together. Okay, um, so we hope that this time is finite and um, we can use our equations that we've derived to now find out what this is. Now by definition this time will be will satisfy the formula that when x1 is evaluated at this time it will also be at the same position as the second mass when evaluated the second time. So x1 of big T will be equal to x2 of big T. Okay, uh, how are we going to use this? Well, we can just subtract x1 from both sides and get that x2 of t minus x1 of t, big T I should say, is equal to zero. And I'm going to call this equation three. Okay, um, now this looks awfully similar to our equation one. This is equation one up here and this is equation two. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do now um, is because I get a zero here, which would make things awfully nice and simple, um, I'm going to evaluate uh, equation two, sorry, equation one. I'm going to evaluate equation one at big T is equal to big T. And when I do this, um, then the left hand side of equation one, when T is equal to big T, will be equal to, by equation three, um, you get x2 of big T minus x1 of big T by equation 3, this is 0, so we get this being equal to 0. And of course this will, by equation 1, be equal to the right hand side of equation 1 when evaluated at big T. When equation 1 is evaluated at big T, we get a times 1 minus the inverse incomplete beta function, half 3 over 2, of kappa times big T. Okay. Um, so now all that's left to do is to solve this equation for big T. Um, first of all, note that uh, a is not equal to zero because a is the distance of their part at the start. So I can therefore say that one must be equal to the inverse incomplete beta function of kappa T. So um, one is therefore, I'm going to write it like this, the inverse incomplete beta function of half three over two of kappa times big T, where remember kappa is the uh, thing we defined last video is equal to the square root of 2 times big G times m1 plus m2 divided by a cubed. Um, and this will be equal to, uh, therefore, 1. Now, we need to, we've got, we've got big T in, inside the argument of the in, inverse incomplete beta function. So in order to solve this, we need to sort of undo this inverse function. Um, and to do this, we're going to just take the incomplete beta function of both sides um, to the half of 3 over 2. Okay, and by uh, the rule of inverse functions, and this is actually the way I defined the inverse incomplete beta function in the first place, is that these kind of cancel off, and we're left with kappa times big T will be equal to the incomplete beta function of half 3 over 2 of 1. And now, in a previous video, I actually worked out what this was, so please check the link in the description I can, if you want to see if you want to see it, um, but you can evaluate it to pi by 2. Um, I did it directly using integration, you can do that directly using integration, you can also use the gamma relationship which um, uh, you, is probably easier. Okay, so we get the big T, kappa times big T is equal to this. Um, I'm now going to plug in my uh, value of kappa and therefore we get uh, that 2 times big G times m1 plus m2 divided by a cubed to the power of a half is equal to pi divided by 2. 
and of course, sorry, I should multiply this side by big T as well. Now, solving for big T, I'll just take the a cubed up here, a to the power of 3 over 2 up here, I'll take, put this down to there, so therefore, we get that our time taken for the masses, I'm just going to give myself a bit more room here, the time taken for the masses to collide will be equal to uh, pi times a to the 3 over 2 divided by, well, that will be equal to 2 times by the square root of 2. Now, 2 times the square root of 2 is the square root of 8, so I'm going to put the 8 here, times g times m1 plus m2 to the power of a half. And this formula should be uh, recognisable to anyone who's looked at uh, how to solve this problem um, of the two mass the time it takes for the two masses to come together. Okay, so let's um, let's see what let's see what other things we can uh, get from this. And some any other nice thing. Okay, so the second nice thing we can get is well, what other useful information can we might we want? Well, we might want to know the position on the x-axis that they collide. So we might also want to know the, um, I'm going to call this big X, the x-coordinate of the collision. Okay, uh, now um, this will simply be defined as um, x1 of x, this will be pretty much when x1 is equal to x2, which is equal to big X, of course, you, these would also be when they're evaluated at this at this function. Um, but since we don't know what x1 and x2 are explicitly yet, then we'll have to use uh, one of these equations to do this. Now, we could use equation 1, but equation 1 won't really, won't really tell us anything, because it will just tell us that this side is 0, and we've already solved what t is, big T is, so we don't really need to, uh, we, that won't really give us anything useful. Um, however, this equation, if we put big X into that equation, then we'll be able to solve for it. So let's evaluate uh, 2 when uh, x1 is equal to x2, which is equal to x. Okay, uh, therefore, uh, m1 times x plus m2 times x will be equal to m2 times a. Of course, we can factor out the big X. We get big X times by m1 plus m2 is equal to m2 times a. And now we can just divide both sides by m1 plus m2, leaving us with the x coordinate of the collision being m2 times a divided by m1 plus m2. Okay, so these are two useful uh, facts that you can you can use. Um, one thing I want to say about this is that actually, if you if you know how to calculate centers of mass, then you'd you'd actually be able to see that this is actually the center of mass of the masses. Um, now, this is this is actually because since the masses were stationary at the beginning, the center of mass never actually moves. So after they've collided, the center of mass will be at the position of the collision, and it will also be at the same place the, throughout the entire time. So uh, you could have actually just done this using physical intuition uh, directly, but it's nice to see that the maths uh, can drop, the physics can drop out of the maths. Uh, it's very lovely to see. Okay, um, so the second thing I want to say about this is that you might, you may expect this problem, I mean this problem is, is symmetric in M1 and M2, in the sense that um, there's nothing special about either of the positions of M1 and M2, um, so you would expect that if you replace M1 with M2 and vice versa, that the equations would look the same. Now, this is not the case because there is some, there is asymmetry in the there is asymmetry in the uh, initial conditions in the sense that M1 was started at zero and M2 was started at position A. If I start if I put the initial position of M1 at say minus A over two and put M2 at A over two then the, the, all the equations would be perfectly symmetric in M1 and M2, i.e. if you swapped M1 and 2 around, you'd end up with the same thing. But this isn't the case here, um, hence why you've got an M2 on the top, which makes this uh, equation asymmetric. Okay, so now that we've found the position of the collision and the time it takes for a collision, let's get into the nitty-gritty and actually finally solve these things for the separately for the explicit uh, positions of the two masses as functions of time. Uh, let's not do dally about it, let's just, let's just plow on. So, uh, we need to solve essentially two linear simultaneous equations for x1 and x2. 
Um, I think the easiest way to do this is, well, I want to look for x1 first because it's nice and in numerical order. So uh, let's subtract. Now, we can't really do like a direct subtraction we'll, um, because, you know, we won't get any nice cancellations. So, however, we've got an m2x2 here. And if we just multiply this equation through by m2, then we'll also have an m2x2 here. So then if we subtract the equations, we'll get something nice. So let's take um, equation 1 multiplied by m2 and then subtract off equation 2. Okay, now I'm going to do this in the black pen, red pen style. So giving, let's do equation 1 in black pen. So we get uh, m2 times x2 minus m2 times x1. This will be the left hand side and if we subtract the left hand side of equation 2 off that will give us minus m1x1 minus m2x2. Two. And you can see that the M2s and X2s already cancelled, which is beautiful. That's exactly what we wanted. Now this will be equal to the right-hand side of equation 1 multiplied by M2. So this will be equal to uh, M2 times A. Now I'm also going to distribute this A out and just uh, expand the bracket. M2A minus, and I'm just bringing the minus down to here because my board is long enough to hold this giant, gigantic equation. Um, so I'm going to multiply by minus, uh, well, we'll have an m2 there and an a, so it'll be minus m2 times a times by the inverse incomplete beta function half 3 over 2 of kappa times t. The kappa is given above. Okay, um, and we also, yeah, let's not forget as well, we need to subtract the right hand side of equation 2. So we need to subtract m2a as well. And ooh, these cancel out nicely. Okay, so we just need to tidy things up and then solve for x1. So um, on this side, you can see that we can actually factor out the uh, a negative sign and we can also factor out x1 because we've got two factors of x1 here. Uh, so let's go ahead and factor that out. So we get minus x1 multiplied by, we've got an m1 there and we've already taken care of the minus sign on the outside so we don't need to put a minus in there. And likewise, same for m2 is equal to uh, minus m2a times the inverse incomplete beta function half 3 over 2 of kappa times t. Okay, uh, ooh, the minus signs cancel out nicely, which is actually quite good because everything on this side is now positive, everything in the equation is now positive, and that's what we would expect um, because x1 is will be a positive coordinate. So we know we're on the right track here. Uh, if we solve this equation, we now get that x1 of t will finally be equal to m2 over m1 plus m2 times a times by the inverse incomplete beta function half 3 over 2 of kappa times by t. And that is our displacement of the first particle as a function of time. Oh, that is absolutely fantastic. But have we made a mistake? Well, as a physics student, you can always uh, check your answer. So, Oh, I forgot to do that in blue. <laughs> so um, let's check the dimensions of this problem. So we expect x1 to be uh, in, the di in the have the units of meters. Now we've got an, a mass here divided by another mass, so that's we can don't need to worry about that. That's dimensionless. A has the units of meters, which is great, and this is a function, so actually that will be dimensionless as long as the thing inside the function is also dimensionless. So um, now kappa times t is that dimensionless? Well, we need to figure out what the units of kappa are, and, oh, well, you can do this by yourself. If you work through the dimensions of kappa, actually, you'll find that it actually has the dimensions of seconds to the minus one. So that will actually cancel with the dimensions of time, and this will be dimensionless inside the function, which is what we want, uh, leaving only that the dimensions of x will be a. So by dimensional analysis, um, this equation holds cor does is not incorrect. I shouldn't say it's correct, because we don't actually know if we've if made another mistake. Um, but we can do some extra sanity checking later, uh, which will help us work out whether we make another mistake. We could, uh, the first thing we can do is also plug t equals zero into this. And actually, the, the inverse, in, because the incomplete beta function is zero at uh, the argument being zero, it means the, the inverse is also zero when the argument is zero. So this will actually give zero, 
which is what we expect because the at time t equals zero, x1 is actually a position uh, x equals zero. So that's lovely. Okay, um, we'll do some extra sort of sanity checking and stuff in the next video when we look at the graphical solutions of these. But for now, we need to plow on and complete the rest of these solutions. Okay, so let's figure out what x2 will be. Now, we've got x1, oh, which is absolutely fantastic, and I've now uh, included kappa in there, so this is like the, the jolly solution. Um, we now just need to solve for x2, and let's just substitute x1 into one of these formulae and then solve for x2. Um, which, equate, which formula looks nicer? Well, I think x, formula 2 looks much nicer, so let's just plug x1 into formula 2. So, uh, and then we'll solve it for x1, for x2. So therefore we get um, m1 multiplied by m2 over m1 plus m2 multiplied by a times the inverse incomplete beta function a half 3 over 2 of, now I'm just going to go back to using kappa because uh, it saves space, plus m2 times x2 is equal to m2 times a. Um, so now we just need to put this onto that side and then solve for x2. Now we can already see that the m2s also already cancel very nicely. Um, so this should be very nice because now we've got like x2 naked uh, on this side. So it'll be very easy to solve for. Um, if we drag this to this side, um, we've also got a factor of a here. So when, after we drag this to this side, we'll be able to factor out a in the brackets immediately and uh, you know you can you can do this yourself. Uh, pause the video if you want it to be verified. But you end up with x two of t being equal to a multiplied by a big open bracket. Now we get a contribution of one, of plus one here um, from this side of the formula, and we uh, just need to subtract off m one over m one plus m two times this bit here. The a's already been factored out. Here, so we can just multiply it directly by the inverse incomplete beta function half 3 over 2 of kappa times t. And that is our position of mass 2. Uh, so let's just do some quick, uh, again, sanity checking. Uh, again, the dimensions are fine because this is dimensionless, this is dimensionless, that's dimensionless, but we have a dimension a here, which is dimension meters, so we, we know we haven't made a mistake there. Um, in the dimensions, at least. Let's see what happens when, x, when t is zero. Now when t is zero, this bit goes away because the inverse incomplete beta function of zero is zero, and we're just left with a, which is indeed the initial, was indeed the initial position of x2 was uh, coordinate a on the x-axis. Uh, so that's fantastic. So we know we, haven't, um, we know we haven't made any obvious mistakes. So let's plow on and um, be physicists and find the velocities of these. Okay, so we've found what the positions of the two masses are, and well, uh, what's there left to do? Um, I mean, this is absolutely fantastic. Now we've found the displacement as a function of time, we, uh, we can now basically solve anything that we want about this problem. Um, however, as a physicist, I feel it would be incomplete not to find the velocities of these, because actually in a general class in classical mechanics problem, you know, you have something that has two degrees of freedom, which means you know, your phase, your phase space is four-dimensional, um, so you've got four canon canonical coordinates you want to solve for. In this case, we've got two of the canonical coordinates, which, the, which are the positions, but we also need to find the momenta. Um, of course, in classical dynamics like this, it's very easy to find the momenta now that we've got the uh, coordinates. Um, but, you know, I'm just going to do this for completeness. So, um, you know, I'm, so let's just go ahead and find the velocities. Now, uh, the... The uh, velocity is going to be given by dx by dt, so let's just find the velocity of particle 1 first. This will be equal to x1 dot of t, and if we dif di differentiate x1, then we get, um, while well, all this stuff do we don't have to worry about, we can leave this outside of the derivative, so I'm just going to leave it outside here. And let's just differentiate the uh, the part which uh, actually has the naughty little t in it. So we're going to differentiate uh, this inverse incomplete beta function, and again I'm going to leave the kappa in. Okay. Uh, now, for, if you watched my video about uh, us differentiating the inverse incomplete beta function, this uh, will make total sense to you. 
Uh, if you haven't, then I recommend you watch it now. If you uh, don't, if you can't be bothered, then that's also fine. You can just trust uh, the working I'm doing. So, if you differentiate this, first of all, of course, we need to use the chain rule. Chain rule, take the kappa out, uh, and then we actually need to differentiate the function itself. If you differentiate an inverse incomplete beta function, then then you need to find what the uh, well, first of all, you will have inverse incomplete beta function, a half 3 over 2 of your argument, taken to, and now, if you remember the formula, it's 1 minus n. n in this case is a half, so we get this taken to 1 minus a half, uh, and this will be multiplied by 1 minus the inverse incomplete beta function, taken to m minus a half, now, uh, sorry, 1 minus m. Now, m in this case is 3 over 2, so we've got 1 minus 3 over 2, and we can now, you know, these are just easy numbers to work out, so we can just say that's going to be a half, that's going to be minus a half, uh, and then we can simplify this. Okay, so this is the full uh, meaty solution of x1 dot of t, the velocity of x1 as a function of time, and, uh, you know, I've obviously skipped out a few steps, but uh, please verify this yourself if you're not fully convinced. Uh, and please let me know if I have uh, indeed made any mistakes. Okay, so uh, what's, what's left to do now is to now find x2 dot of t. Um, unfortunately, however, I literally don't have enough space on my board to write this out in full. Um, but actually, this is a lot simpler than, it, than we might think. Now, if we... how do we find x2 dot of t, well we could just differentiate this, um, but instead I'd rather just use some other relation if I can, and equation 2 will provide that perfect relation. Now if we take the derivative of equation 2, um, then we get some, something which may be familiar to you if you watched the last video, which is that m1x1 dot plus m2x2 dot, yeah, because I've just differentiated the x1 and x2 terms here, um, will be equal to the time derivative of the right-hand side, and the time derivative of the right-hand side will just be zero because it's constant, so that will be equal to zero. Okay, so if we rearrange this, we get that uh, m1x1 dot equals minus m2x2 dot, so we can solve for x2 dot to give us that's x2 dot of t will just be minus m1 over m2 times x1 dot of t. So, pretty much it's a nice and simple relation. Um, in fact, we could just write it out right here. That pretty, all this division does is just change that m2 to an m1 there's a minus sign, and then this this would actually be the uh, x2 dot of t as a, as a function of time. So in a way, I've actually written down all of them uh, in one video. Um, but in terms of what can fit on my board, um, but in terms of what I can fit on my board, then uh, this is the full juicy um, solution to the problem of two masses uh, coming together under the influence of their own mutual gravitational attraction. Thank you very much for watching. Oh, and don't forget to join me in the next video where we're going to actually be doing graphical analysis of these lovely things and try and get some actual meaning out of them because looking at them right now, it doesn't really feel that meaningful. So next video, we're going to be looking at the actual meaning. Thank you. Please stay tuned.